I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Good morning, and welcome to worship this morning. I have several announcements I'd like to bring to your attention. The first has to do with your bulletin. On the front of your bulletin, you might have found a quarter taped to it. Don't lose that quarter. You're going to need it a little bit later in worship, and I'll tell you more about that later this morning. Secondly, I've been asked to please uh, hit it again on the hymn requests. Uh, on June 30th, we'll be doing a hymn sing, so uh, if you want your, your favorite hymn included in that, there are no guarantees, but um, my, I've been assured that you can put it in the ballot box that's located in the narthex. You can drop it in the offering plate. You can leave it on the organ. You can put it in Mark's hands. I'll go so far as to say you can even put it in my hands, and I'll be happy to, um, to make sure that Mark gets your favorite hymns. Um, we're looking forward to a very special hymn sing service at the end of the month. Also, um, Faith and Family Fun Night is an intergenerational event at Mud Hens uh, Ballpark on Sunday, June 30th. And the gates open at 3 p.m. And dinner will be available in our special area from 3.30 until 5. The game starts at 4 p.m., and um, it's quite a lot of fun. If you need more information about it, sign up is due by Friday, and tickets are $39 a person, and it, it's all inclusive. So we thought that that would be a fun outing for all of us to join in that. Also, um, I want to remind you that our carnival is coming up on Saturday, the 22nd of June. Um, please see Jen. Uh, for, um, for your volunteer assignment for the carnival. Um, and speaking of Jen, she and our four youth arrived home last evening from Montreat. Next Sunday, you won't want to miss worship because they will be leading us in worship and they will um, bring to us their report from their experiences this past week at Montreat Youth Conference. Um, I think that's all I have this morning. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship.
Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. We wait for you, O oh God. We wait for your steadfast love more than those who watch for the morning. We, we wait for you to lift the lowly more than those who watch for the morning. We wait for your unexpected grace more than those who watch for the morning. Let us sing of God's holy ways, the glory of the one for whom we wait. Let us pray. Steadfast God, you constantly surprise us with unexpected grace and unexpected redemption, forgiving us when we least deserve it, showing love to those we most despise. Enliven us to keep watch for your love at work in those we demonize, for your power in those we look down upon, and for your deliverance from all the ways that we try to make you conform to the structures and systems we have built. All this we pray through Jesus Christ, who called us to a new way of being. Amen. In Reformed tradition, when we worship, we confess not only our own sin, but that of the world, and the confidence that God's grace will abound. It is only by the power of God that we are able to stand against evil. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sin. You have called us blessed, O God, and washed us in the waters of grace. You have called us a family, O God, and bound us by the presence of your Spirit. Forgive us, O Holy One, when we try to forget that we belong to you. 
When we bind ourselves to the illusion of independence, the myth of supremacy, or the fear of what might happen if we placed our trust in something beyond ourselves, forgive us, O Holy One, and by your forgiveness, free us from bounds. Amen. Now, stand firm in your faith, covered by the saving grace of God, and ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. May the peace of Christ be with you all. Please turn to those around you and share a sign of the peace. Let us pray. Holy, holy, holy one, guide us by the spirit of truth to hear the word of life you speak and to give all glory, honor, and praise to your threefold name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our first scripture today comes from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. Then he went home. And the crowd came together again, so that they could not even eat. When his family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He's gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. And he called them to him and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no longer, can, but no longer one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up that strong man. Then, indeed, the house can be plundered. Truly, I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemies against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. 
for they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. Join me in a responsive reading. Out of the depths I cried to you, O Lord. Lord, 
hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you so that you may be revered. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord. More than those who watch for the morning. More than those who watch for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love. And with him is great power to redeem. It is he who will redeem Israel from all its iniquities. From Genesis. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, or you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked And they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden at the time of the evening breeze. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? (coughs) The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is it that you have done? And the woman said, The serpent tricked me, and I ate. And the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman, And between your offspring and hers, and he will strike your head, and you will strike his heel. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I always enjoy reading this story, not because it's particularly a favorite but because it is about placing blame. And who doesn't like to place blame somewhere other than right here? I remember as a child, I would run to my mother and tell her some story about one of my sisters or my brother doing something, and I was sure that they would get into trouble. I was pointing fingers. Look at what they're doing. And then a very wise teacher, once upon a time, said, do you know that every time you point at someone in accusation, 
you have three fingers that are pointing right back at you. And I didn't really like how that felt. But in this story, Eve knows that the tree from the center of the garden is not to be touched. And the serpent knows that the tree in the center of the garden is not to be touched. And yet, the serpent is out to get the humans. The serpent says to Eve, the only reason God doesn't want you to eat that food, that fruit, is because then you will be like God and you'll know things. Don't you want to be like God? Temptation planted. And who knows how many conversations like this the serpent had with the woman. And finally, her defenses were weak and she gave in and said, okay, I'll bite, literally. Bit and ate of the fruit, and it was lovely and wonderful. And she gave it to her husband and said, but it's so good. And then he ate, and they realized that they were naked and immediately had shame. And so they covered themselves and hid from the Lord in the garden. And then in the cool of the day, the Lord walked through the garden and the man and the woman hid themselves from him. And the Lord called out saying, where are you? Well, we, we hid because we were naked and we didn't want to be seen. Well, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I told you not to partake? And immediately the man looks at God and then he points at the woman and he says, the woman that you gave to be with me. She gave me the fruit and I ate, pointing fingers at the woman with three fingers pointing right back at himself. And then God looks at the woman and the woman said, the serpent told me it was okay, pointing a finger at the serpent with three fingers pointing right back at herself. Pointing fingers is always easy and sometimes fun, and yet there are consequences for doing so. In this case, it leads to the expulsion from the garden. Here is the place where God had created paradise, for humankind, and somehow they messed it up. So paradise was no longer a possibility. It is like two sides of the same coin. They knew only paradise until such time as they knew sin. So sin and obedience, two sides of the same coin. Good and evil, two sides of the same coin. Dark and light, we know one because of its relationship to the other. And pointing fingers is one way that we try to deflect
from our own sinfulness. Well, I wasn't alone when I did that. So it's not my fault. I gave in to peer pressure. Again, pointing fingers at peers. It is an age-old story. And it moves from individual sin into corporate sin. It moves from one age to the next. And we point our fingers and we lay blame. But what if, what if we recognized our own culpability what if the story went something like this? Eve, what have we done? Well, Adam, the temptation was too great and I gave in. And then I also shared it with you and I'm sorry. What if the man and the woman, <coughs> excuse me, what if the man and the woman had gone to the Lord and said, you remember that tree that you told us not to eat from? We ate from it. We're sorry. What would have happened if they had owned up to their sin, to their disobedience? What would happen if such a thing had happened? Instead of trying to hide it, they owned up to it. So often, when things go wrong, we try to hide things and we do not want them to come into the light of day. But what if we pull back the curtain and exposed the disobedience, exposed the sin, exposed the transgression? What then could happen? I'd like to think that if such a story had happened in the garden, perhaps we would all still be dwelling in the garden because we owned up to our own sin. I think that there is something to be said for making mistakes. And there is something to be said for owning our own mistakes. Yes, I messed up. Yes, I apologize. Can you forgive me? There is an ad that's been running on television. And I'm not exactly sure the source of it, but you've probably seen similar ads that JesusGetsUs.com has done. And they talk to international individuals and they ask, what is the hardest thing to say in the English language? And one person says, it's the combination of the TH letters, the is very hard for international individuals to pronounce. And they, they said letter combinations of S-C-H, and sometimes it's sh, and sometimes it's sk. They go on, and then they said, well, wait, did you mean letter and sound combinations, or do you mean what is the hardest Thing to express and they go into I'm sorry I was wrong I love you can we work it out things that are hard to say perhaps in any language but things that let us know that Jesus gets it, that it's hard to be human and it's hard to be right all of the time. In fact, it's impossible. 
everyone makes mistakes. It's how we deal with those mistakes that God is about. And Jesus, even surrounded by the crowds yet again, and the accusation that he is possessed by a demon, and he says, no, how can, a, how can Satan tear apart his own house and still stand? Jesus says, no, it's not a demon. And then he says, the only sin that is unforgivable is to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit. If that is the only sin that is unforgivable, then why is humankind so unforgiving of itself? How many times have we beaten ourselves up over something that happened years ago and we just don't seem to be able to let go of it? I promise you, take it to Christ, lay it at his feet, and let it go. Your burden will be much lighter, and you will experience relief and forgiveness. This blaspheming against the Holy Spirit that is a whole other plane of sin. That is to challenge the Lord God himself. That is to say, I do not believe. And even that, we can come back from, I believe. There are moments when our faith is tested when we are tried beyond what we think we can handle. And then we wait for more. I believe that the only limit that God has is the one that we place on God in our own minds. The stories that we tell ourselves I am unforgivable. I am unlovable. These are the limits that we put out there ourselves, not the limits of God's love, and certainly not the limits of God's grace and forgiveness. If we are made truly in God's image, then in my mind, it is an impossibility for us to blaspheme against the Holy Spirit without destroying our own selves, which is not what God wants. The man and the woman were walking in the garden, and the woman said, here is this piece of fruit. I've discovered it's lovely and wonderful and delicious. Here, have some. What if, what if she had gone to the man and said, I made a mistake. Will you support me? And will you tell the Lord with me about it? Letting our mistakes come into the light is a good thing. Standing before the Lord, knowing that the Lord knows what we hope the Lord doesn't know. Well, it could be uncomfortable but it's not unforgivable. My friends, what if we stood before the Lord like we do every week, confessing our sin and truly receiving forgiveness 
believing it in our hearts that God loves without limit, that God's grace extends to each of us, and that nothing is unforgivable. We may have been expelled from paradise in Genesis, but living in the shadow of God's love and grace, well, maybe I should have said living in the light of God's love and God's grace, is living in God our Father's world. And it is paradise unto itself. Amen and amen. Will you stand as you are able and let us sing together? With the whole church, let us declare what we believe using the words adapted from the Confession of 1967, which is printed in your bulletin. The life, death, resurrection, and promised coming of Jesus Christ has set the pattern for the church's mission. His human life involves the church in the common life of all people. His service to men and women commits the church to work for every form of human well-being. His suffering makes the church sensitive to all human suffering so that it sees the face of the Christ, faces of the persons in every kind of need. His crucifixion discloses to the church God's judgment on the humanity that marks human relations and the awful consequences the church's own complicity in injustice, the power of the risen Christ, and the hope of his coming, the church sees the promise of God's renewal of human life in society and of God's victory over all wrong. The church follows this pattern in the form of its life and in the method of its action. So to live and serve is to confess Christ as Lord.
You may be seated. Let us turn our hearts and minds to God in prayer. Loving God, we want to live in a Lord-built house, a house that is built on stone for its foundation, a house that is built on love and grace, forgiveness, We ask, O God, that you would hear our prayers as we offer them on behalf of the world. For those who are in war-torn areas, grant your peace. We pray for Ukraine and Russia, for Israel and Gaza. Let the people know, O oh God, that you are present and that you have not abandoned them. Make your will be done. For those who dwell in areas of civil war and oppression and violence, be present, giving comfort and care and hope. We pray for your church, that it would be a beacon of light and love in the world, that it would restore hope, bring aid and relief, that we as your people would be in the world to care for those who are oppressed and laid low. We pray for our nation. We pray during this election year and cycle that you would call leaders to service and that they would serve the best interest of the people and the world. We pray, O oh God, that you would lead us and guide us along the way of life. We pray for those who are known to us and for those who are known only to you, O oh God. Bring healing and hope and comfort according to your will. We make our prayer in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ, who taught his disciples to pray with the boldness of children, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is not very often that we get to have a worship service that has two offerings in it. But the first offering is a noisy offering. And I'm going to ask our ushers if they will go to the back and collect um, the watering cans that are in the back. You can give them a little rattle if you want to, because it's noisy. It's noisy. And you saw that quarter that was taped to the front of your bulletin this morning. And so as our ushers come forward, and you can go ahead and start coming forward right now, go ahead and pull that quarter off. And if you have some extra spare change, this is the start of our series of noisy offerings. So go ahead and drop that quarter. And if you have some extra spare change, go ahead and drop some spare change in there. And I'll tell you why. There is an organization called Operation Clean Duds, and they are working with one of the local uh, laundromats and trying to expand in the area. 
but they're making it so that choir, do you have, if, if you have money that's not loud, that's okay too that you want to drop in. So, um, so anyhow, but Operation Clean Duds is a ministry organization that will let uh, people come and do laundry in the laundromat and do, um, and do their laundry. They actually stand by and place their quarters into the machines. They provide soap and drying as well for folks who are in need. And so Operation Clean Duds, and this is, this is one of the things that we'll support. This is our first noisy offering. We'll do them on the second Sunday of the month. And for the next two months, we'll be supporting Operation Clean Duds. So this month, and then July and August as well for the noisy offering. And then for the second offering, this is for the mission and ministry of Christ Presbyterian Church. So you can place your offering in the plate as it is passed or follow the instructions on the QR code which is displayed. Great and loving God, we give you thanks for the gifts that you have given in abundance. Receive these, our gifts, multiply them, and use them for the mission and ministry of your church according to your will. For we pray in the name of Christ and all God's children say, Amen. Amen.
I would be remiss if I did not remind you that a book study starts this, after, uh, this morning right after worship. Um, Barry, are they meeting in the hospitality room? Or, oh, in, cha- in the chapel, okay. So join Barry Murr in the chapel. You don't have to have read anything yet today. Um, the book is gonna be fantastic by Geraldine Brooks. And so if you would like to do that, get your cup of coffee, visit a little bit, and then go across into the chapel and um, enjoy that book study. So my friends, go out into the world knowing that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit remain with us all now and forevermore. Amen and amen.